Okay, welcome everybody. This is the final chapter for the semester on development and heredity. Human development starts with fertilization with the union of gametes and continues throughout life. Developmental biology is the study of the changes in form and function from fertilized egg through old age, while embryology studies the events that occur during the 38 weeks of development inside the mother's womb. You can see a list of the developmental stages in the graphic here in the, uh, in the slide going from pre-embryonic to embryonic to fetal. The prenatal period is the developmental stage that occurs approximately 38 weeks duration within the mother's womb. It's the period people usually refer to as pregnancy. The postnatal period begins at birth and continues throughout life. The three stages of prenatal development that occur during the 38-week period in the womb include the pre-embryonic period that lasts for the first two weeks post-fertilization where the zygote divides mitotically many times to make a multicellular structure known as the blastocyst that implants in the endometrium of the uterus. The embryonic period that extends from week 3 through 8 of gestation where the conceptus grows, folds, and forms rudimentary organ systems and is called the embryo. And then the final stage, which is the fetal period, which lasts from week 9 through 38, or until birth. The conceptus is now a fetus. It grows larger and continues to develop until its organ systems can function without the assistance from the mother. After birth, the fetus becomes a newborn, and postnatal life begins. The postnatal period is marked by rapid development, the changes that continue in the postnatal period are split into five stages. It extends from birth to one month. Infancy continues development through two years of age, and childhood lasts until the period of sexual maturation or puberty. At this point, adolescence begins, starts, and ends when the individual is capable of sexual reproduction. Adulthood extends from the end of adolescence until death, the stage at which development ends and breakdown of tissues and organs known as senescence begins. Eventually, senescence will lead to death, even without a specific disease state. And we'll get into why that is um, at the end of this chapter, why we die. Because theoretically, uh, if you're a living cell and you have the proper extracellular environment, access to oxygen and nutrients, and a way to get rid of waste products, you should continue indefinitely as a living entity, but in point of fact, that doesn't happen. Uh, cells have a finite lifetime, and we have a little bit of insight as to why that occurs. Another important point before we begin the, the broader discussion of development is the fact that um, we have to understand that we are a sexually reproducing species. We've been through the reproductive system in the previous chapter. We are sexually reproducing okay meaning that it takes both a male and a female gamete to produce a zygote that will eventually form a new individual. Now, because of that, we're a combination of genetic material from both our mother and our father, which means that we're not identical to either parent. The benefit of this is that we're not identical genetically to either parent, meaning that we have differences physiologically, psychologically, biochemically that differentiate us from our parents. That difference is magnified in the process of meiosis in which we, as a result of crossing over at prophase of meiosis 1, generate unique arrangements of genes on the chromosomes that aren't present in either parent. What this does for the species is it increases biodiversity. Okay, so biodiversity.
Now, why is that important? It's important because that means, as a species, we're not all carbon copies of each other. If we were, a set of circumstances that would kill or sicken one of the member of the population would destroy the entire population. And so with a diverse population, you have a greater likelihood of surviving as a species. There are organisms that don't reproduce sexually, um, single-celled organisms, um, bacteria, protozoa, um, reproduce through um, binary fission in the case of bacteria or mitosis in the case of single-celled organisms. There are also multicellular organisms that can reproduce asexually, but the problem with this is that the offspring are all identical to the original parent organism. And the result then is that something that destroys one member of that population will destroy the entire population. Um, these asexually reproducing species try to outrun this problem by sheer numbers. That's not a practical consideration in something as complex as the human body. So biodiversity is a much better strategy to survive environmental challenges in this instance. So let's take a look at fertilization. Fertilization is the epic story of a single sperm facing incredible odds to unite with an egg and form a new human life. It is the story of all of us. During sexual intercourse, about 300 million sperm enter the vagina. Soon afterward, millions of them will either flow out of the vagina or die in its acidic environment. However, many survive because of the protective elements provided in the fluid surrounding them. Next, the sperm must pass through the cervix, an opening into the uterus. Usually, it remains tightly closed, but here the cervix is open for a few days while the woman ovulates. The sperm swim through the cervical mucus, which is thinned to a more watery consistency for easier passage. Once inside the cervix, the sperm continue swimming toward the uterus, though millions will die trying to make it through the mucus. Some sperm remain behind, caught in the folds of the cervix, but they may later continue the journey as a backup to the first group. Inside the uterus, muscular uterine contractions assist the sperm on their journey toward the egg. However, resident cells from the woman's immune system mistaking the sperm for foreign invaders, destroy thousands more. Next, half the sperm head for the empty fallopian tube, while the other half swim toward the tube containing the unfertilized egg. Now, only a few thousand remain. Inside the fallopian tube, tiny cilia push the egg toward the uterus. To continue, the sperm must surge against this motion to reach the egg. Some sperm get trapped in the cilia and die. During this part of the journey, chemicals in the reproductive tract cause the membranes covering the heads of the sperm to change. As a result, the sperm become hyperactive, swimming harder and faster toward their destination. At long last, the sperm reach the egg. Only a few dozen of the original 300 million sperm remain. The egg is covered with a layer of cells called the corona radiata. The sperm must push through this layer to reach the outer layer of the egg, the zona pellucida. When sperm reach the zona pellucida, they attach to specialized sperm receptors on the surface, which triggers their acrosomes to release digestive enzymes enabling the sperm to burrow into the layer. Inside the zona pellucida is a narrow, fluid-filled space just outside the egg cell membrane. The first sperm to make contact will fertilize the egg. After a perilous journey and against incredible odds, a single sperm attaches to the egg cell membrane. 
Within a few minutes, their outer membranes fuse and the egg pulls the sperm inside. This event causes changes in the egg membrane that prevent other sperm from attaching to it. Next, the egg releases chemicals that push other sperm away from the egg and create an impenetrable fertilization membrane. As the reaction spreads outward, the zona pellucida hardens, trapping any sperm unlucky enough to be caught inside. Outside the egg, sperm are no longer able to attach to the zona pellucida. Meanwhile, inside the egg, the tightly packed male genetic material spreads out. A new membrane forms around the genetic material, creating the male pronucleus. Inside, the genetic material reforms into 23 chromosomes. The female genetic material, awakened by the fusion of the sperm with the egg, finishes dividing, resulting in the female pronucleus, which also contains 23 chromosomes. As the male and female pronuclei form, spiderweb-like threads, called microtubules, pull them toward each other. The two sets of chromosomes join together, completing the process of fertilization. At this moment, a unique genetic code arises, instantly determining gender, hair color, eye color, and hundreds of other characteristics. This new single cell, the zygote, is the beginning of a new human being. And now the cilia in the fallopian tube gently sweep the zygote toward the uterus, where he or she will implant in the rich uterine lining, growing and maturing for the next nine months until ready for birth. Okay, about 30 hours after fertilization, the zygote begins cleavage, which is mitotic divisions generating small, genetically identical cells known as blastomeres. The divisions occur too quickly for the cells to grow, so cell number increases, but cell size gets progressively smaller. Each subsequent division takes less time than the previous, so that by the second day there are four cells, and by the end of the third day there are 16. At this stage, the cells begin differentiation. They'll be building blocks of all future tissues of developing um, conceptual tissue, known as the morula, and the remains are covered by a membrane known as the zona pellucida. So what's happening here in differentiation is that the cells are encountering extracellular signals that are changing the way that they utilize their genetic material, and thus the way they look and act and the products that they generate and their appearance. By the time the blastocyst is ready for implantation, it has two distinct cell populations. An outer layer of large flattened cells called the trophoblast, which surround the fluid-filled cavity and participate in forming the placenta, which is a temporary organ providing nutrients and oxygen to the conceptus, and also suppresses the mother's immune system, preventing it from attacking the conceptus. There's also an inner cluster of rounded cells, known as the inner cell mass, that form the embryo itself, which is the developing body. This is the inner cell mass, what's eventually going to be you. Okay? Um, uh, inner cell mass down here in purple. Okay? Occasionally, within the first eight days post-fertilization, the cells split into two groups and develop two individuals, and these are known as identical or monozygotic twins. They have a nearly identical appearance and they share the same placenta. They have the same genetic composition. Rarely, identical triplets or quadruplets can result from separations during these early cell divisions. Now, why this happens is a little bit of a mystery. We think that there may be a genetic component to this. We do know that um, there's some evidence that twins run in families. So, this may be a property of the mother's DNA. We're not sure. Dizygotic twins are a more common type of twinning that result from the ovulation of two secondary oocytes at the same time, fertilized by two separate sperm cells. These individuals may be different sexes and very dissimilar in appearance. 
Rarely, multiple ovulations can produce triplets, quadruplets, or greater numbers of offspring. Now, what's important to understand about these monozygotic versus dizygotic twins is that the differences present in monozygotic twins um, physiologically, biochemically, etc. are due exclusively to environmental influence, whereas the differences that we see in fraternal twins are due both to genetic and environmental components. And so geneticists are very interested in how much of a particular trait comes from inheritance and how much of a particular trait comes from interaction with the environment and by comparing differences in traits which are any measurable characteristic between identical and fraternal twins they can determine how much of a particular trait is exclusively genetic. Implantation occurs about four to seven days post-fertilization when the blastocyst begins to attach to the endometrium of the uterus. The trophoblast invades the stratum functionalis layer of the endometrium by secreting digestive enzymes that catalyze reactions that degrade the endometrium. The trophoblast cells divide into two layers, the inner cytotrophoblast where cells remain intact and the syncytiotrophoblast where the plasma membranes disappear and the cells fuse generating a single large syncytia, that's a multinucleate cell, that secretes enzymes to digest uterine cells almost immediately after formation. The syncytia trophoblast is also responsible for producing human chorionic gonadotropin, which stimulates and maintains the corpus luteum in the ovary so that it can continue to secrete estrogen and progesterone to promote placental development and to maintain the endometrium. Progesterone also suppresses menstruation maintaining the endometrium of the uterus and prolonging the secretory phase of the uterine cycle. Note that HCG is produced only during pregnancy, making it the basis for pregnancy tests. HCG levels rise in the mother's blood until the end of the second month of development, when a membrane called the chorion takes over the role of the corpus luteum in secreting estrogen and progesterone. At that point, human chorionic gonadotropin is no longer needed, its level declines and remains low for the remainder of the pregnancy. So this is, this is very important because the corpus luteum is going to degenerate into the corpus albicans eventually regardless of whether there is an implantation of the blastocyst. Simultaneously, the inner cell mass separates from the trophoblast and differentiates into two layers. The superior epiblast and inferior hypoblast together form a flat bilaminar embryonic disc. Bilaminar means two layers. A small cavity appears within the epiblast and will enlarge to become the amniotic cavity. This will surround the embryo and fill with fluid. The bilaminar embryonic disc will eventually become the three primary germ layers that produce all the body tissues. These germ layers are the ectoderm, mesoderm, and endoderm and are the blueprint for future organ development. If for some reason the conceptus isn't viable, for example, there's a chromosomal abnormality, it may die in a process known as a spontaneous abortion or miscarriage, and the pregnancy ends. On rare occasion, the blastocyst implants in a site different from the uterus. If the pregnancy continues, the result is an ectopic pregnancy, and in years past, um, we used to have to um, do a surgical abortion to save the life of the mother in the event of an ectopic pregnancy, but today they can actually find these implants and put them back in the uterus and the pregnancy can go to term. The bilaminar embryonic disc and trophoblast together produce extra embryonic membranes. They first appear during the second week of development but continue to develop during embryonic and fetal periods. The membranes include the yolk sac, the amnion, the allantois, and the chorion. Collectively, these membranes protect the embryo and help with vital functions, including nutrition, gas exchange, storage, and removal of waste. The yolk sac comes from hypoblast cells, which are the first embryonic membranes to develop. In some animals, such as birds, the yolk sac is a nutritional source for the developing offspring. In humans, cells from the yolk sac 
form portions of the GI tract and are also the first source of blood cells and blood vessels. The yolk sac also produces the first germ cells, which are precursors of gametes, and will eventually migrate to the developing ovaries and testes. So let's take a look at the development of the extra embryonic membrane. During the second week of development, the inner cell mass will flatten to become an embryonic disc composed of several layers. The hypoblast, columnar cells which will eventually compose the endoderm and yolk sac, and cuboidal cells of the epiblast, which will eventually compose ectoderm and the amnion. The cells of the trophoblast become the extra embryonic membrane known as the chorion. These are embryonic cells, but they will not make up part of the embryo's body. They are an extra embryonic membrane. These will form the fetal part of the placenta, which exchanges nutrients with maternal blood. Also, the chorion secretes HCG, the human chorionic gonadotropin, and the chorion will suppress the mother's immune system so that the mother's immune system does not attack the embryo. Around day eight, cells of the hypoblast contribute to the formation of the extra embryonic membrane known as the yolk sac. Invertebrates which develop in eggs, obviously the yolk is extremely important since it is the source of the nutrition which will sustain the embryo. In live-bearing mammals and humans, the yolk sac does not perform this function. Although it does serve for the formation of the first blood cells, the formation of the germ cells, which will ultimately migrate to the gonads uh, for reproduction, and a few other minor functions before it degenerates. Eight days after fertilization, the cells of the epiblast contribute to the formation of an extra embryonic membrane known as the amnion. The amniotic sac will eventually surround the entire embryo and fetus and be filled with an amniotic fluid. This fluid originates as a filtrate from maternal blood, but later urine secreted by the fetus will contribute as well. This amniotic fluid prevents the fetus from drying out, prevents tissues from adhering to fetal cells, and will help absorb shock. And it was the development of the amnion which helped the mammals, birds, and reptiles, the group known as the amniotes, to reproduce on land rather than in water as amphibians do. Beginning 12 days after development, a space develops between the chorion and the amnion yolk sac and embryo known as the extra embryonic coelom. In an ectopic pregnancy, the conceptus implants and grows in a location other than the uterus. In the U.S., 1-2% to 2 of pregnancies are ectopic. Almost all of these are tubal pregnancies where the fertilized egg inserts into the oviduct. It can also occur in the abdominal cavity, ovary, or cervix. And remember, the reason for this is that the ovary and the fallopian tube are not a closed system. They have a physical space between them and so occasionally the egg can end up in the abdominal pelvic cavity. This presents a huge risk to the mother as only the uterus is able to expand and sustain the conceptus. If an ectopic pregnancy doesn't terminate on its own in a spontaneous abortion, medical intervention is necessary to remove the conceptus, otherwise the region where it's implanted will rupture and result in serious bleeding and possibly the death of the mother. But as we've pointed out, um, we have the ability now to take these implants and put them back into the uterus so that they can develop and the pregnancy can go to term. Alright, so let's look at the embryonic period. The embryonic period starts at the third week of development and continues through the eighth week. The blastocyst is fully implanted, the inner cell mass is differentiated into the bilaminar embryonic disc, and the extra embryonic membranes are developed. During this five-week stage, the conceptus is referred to as an embryo. The embryonic period starts with a process known as gastrulation. Rearrangement and migration 
of the cells of the bilamber, bilaminar embryonic disc form a trilaminar disc. Three germ layers develop during this period that will become all the major organ systems in the process of organogenesis by the end of week eight. The placenta forms during this period and begins to provide nutrition and oxygen to the embryo and remove waste products. Events leading up to the formation of the germ layers include, during week three, the two cell layers, epiblast and hypoblast, developing a thin groove on the dorsal surface known as the primitive streak, which elongates along the cephalic caudal line of the embryo, that's head to tail, establishing the head and tail regions, the right and left side, and the dorsal and ventral surface. Gastrulation starts after primitive streak formation has completed. It starts as the cells detach from the epiblast and move into the primitive streak in a process called ingression. The first cells that migrate in this way become the inner germ layer or endoderm, and this replaces the hypoblast. The next cells that migrate between the epiblast and endoderm become the middle layer or mesoderm. The remaining cells of the epiblast form the ectoderm. By the end of week three, all three primary germ layers are formed. The embryo has become a trilaminar embryonic disc characteristics. This all happens as a result of signals that are present in the extracellular environment that tell the cells what to do by interacting with cell surface receptors. This in turn generates signals that ultimately alter the way that these cells utilize their genetic material. So what happens over time is that as cells move from a, a less differentiated to more differentiated state, they're using less and less of the total genetic material in the nucleus that shapes the way that the cells um, look, perform, act, and so on. The flattened trilaminar embryonic disc changes shape during the fourth week of development when two types of folding cause the flat embryonic disc to become cylindrical. Cephalocaudal folding occurs in the head and tail regions of the embryo and creates the future head and buttock regions of the embryo. Lateral folding occurs when the left and right sides of the embryo curve and fold towards midline. As these sides move closer together, the yolk sac is pinched off, leaving only a small area of endoderm called the vitellin duct. Transverse folding creates the future trunk region and almost immediately forms the primitive gut, this later becomes the digestive tract inside the abdominal cavity. Organogenesis is a process where the three primary germ layers differentiate into organs and organ systems. When this process begins, the primary germ layers have undergone cephalocaudal and transverse folding and are starting to differentiate. The embryo is about half an inch long at this point. When the embryonic period ends at the end of week eight, the embryo will be, will be about an inch long and will have recognizable organ systems. Although not all organs will be functional, some will begin to work. The ectoderm forms the epidermis of the skin and is responsible for making the majority of the nervous system and sense organs. The first major event of organogenesis is neuralation. Cells of the ectoderm thicken and form neural plate bulbs. Um, a neural plate is something that's induced by a structure called the notochord. This Neural plate then folds inward and deepens. The edges fuse to form a neural tube, which then pinches off to form the ectodermal layer. The anterior end of the neural tube will become the brain and the brain stem, and the remainder will become the spinal cord. By the end of the fourth week, the anterior end of the neural tube develops into three enlarged areas called the primary brain vesicles, the forebrain, midbrain, and hindbrain. Neural crest cells found between the layers of ectoderm that form the epidermis and neural tube will migrate throughout the embryo and give rise to the cranial, spinal, and sympathetic ganglia associate and associated nerves, so a lot of the peripheral nervous system. Pigments of, pigment cells of the skin, cells of the adrenal medulla, connective tissue cells as well. Mesodermal cells beneath the primitive streak form a structure called the notochord which serves to support and organize the embryo around a central axis and also induce the formation of the neural plate. Remnants of the notochord 
remain in intervertebral discs as the notochord is surrounded <coughs> by vertebrae during development. Mesoderm on either side of the notochord forms somites, which are block-like structures, each of which has three regions. A sclerotome, which develops into vertebrae and ribs. A dermatome, which develops into the dermis of the skin. And the myotome, that develops into most of the skeletal muscles. <clears throat> On the lateral sides of the somites are clusters of mesoderm called intermediate mesoderm and lateral plate mesoderm. Intermediate mesoderm forms the gonads and the kidneys, <clears throat> while lateral plate mesoderm develops into spleen, adrenal cortex, cardiovascular system structures, the serous membrane of body cavities, connective tissue components of the limbs as well. The endoderm forms the cavity of the middle ear and auditory tube and becomes the internal epithelial layer of the digestive, respiratory, urinary, and reproductive system. It forms several glands and accessory digestive organs, including thyroid, parathyroid, thymus, palatine tonsils, and the majority of the liver, gallbladder, and the pancreas. A summary of organogenesis is shown in Figure 27.8 in your book. By the end of the embryonic period, organogenesis is finished. At four weeks, the embryo has three primary brain vesicles and somites. At eight weeks, the embryo looks essentially human, although with different body proportions. During this period, the embryo is very sensitive to teratogens, which are chemicals that can produce mutations in DNA and or um, alter developmental processes. This can result in birth defects or even death. All body structures derive from the three primary germ layers. Table 27.2, which we'll look at in a minute, talks about the structures produced by each layer. And so, <clears throat> I'm not going to go through every, um, every aspect of this chart here, but we can make some general <clears throat> quick um, observations, right? Ectoderm is going to form epidermis. And CNS and PNS structures. Mesoderm, cardiovascular, and musculoskeletal system. Portions of the urinary and respiratory and GI. an endoderm lining of respiratory GI and urogenital <clears throat> it's an inner lining <clears throat> also the parathyroid thyroid and the thymus. A flattened trilaminar embryonic disc that's formed after the initial rearrangement of the cell layers in the inner cell mass changes shape during the fourth week of development when two types of folding cause the flat embryonic disc to become cylindrical. Cephalocaudal folding occurs in the head and tail regions of the embryo creating the future head and buttock regions. Lateral folding occurs when the left and right sides of the embryo curve and fold towards midline. As these sides move close together, the yolk sac pinches off, leaving a small area of endoderm known as the vitellin duct. Transverse folding creates the future trunk region and almost immediately forms the primitive gut. Later, this will become the digestive tract inside the abdominal cavity. Okay, let's take a look now at the fetal period. The fetal period of development runs from the beginning of week 9 until birth and that usually occurs around week 38. During the pre-embryonic period the developing embryo 
gets nutrients from uterine milk secreted from endometrial glands and endometrial cells from the uterine wall. The embryo continues to receive nutrition from digested endometrial cells until the placenta is fully formed, which is at week 12 during the fetal period. Placentation is the process of forming the placenta, which attaches to the uterine wall and to the embryo or fetus through the umbilical cord. It's a temporary organ that's shed after the infant is born. It's the site of exchange of oxygen, nutrients, and waste between the mother and fetus. The placenta also generates hormones that support pregnancy. Placentation starts during implantation, but the majority of placental growth occurs during the fetal period. When the embryonic period begins, the blastocyst is implanted in the uterus and chorionic villi have penetrated uterine blood vessels to form lacunae filled with maternal blood. These merge into a single blood-filled cavity called the placental sinus. Once placentation has begun, the stratum functionalis of the uterus is known as the decidua. The region of endometrium that lies beneath the fetus becomes the decidua basalis, and the region that surrounds the uterine cavity is called the decidua capsularis. The placenta is a unique organ because it develops from both fetal and maternal tissue. Chorionic villi are filled with blood vessels carrying fetal blood and surrounded by maternal blood in the placental sinus. However, blood supplies don't mix. The placental barrier is made of a basement membrane and a thin layer of syncytiotrophoblast that keeps the blood supply of the mother and fetus separated until birth. Since maternal and fetal blood supplies are so close, some substances are exchanged across the placental barrier between the fetus and the mother. Oxygen and nutrients diffuse from maternal blood into the fetus for transport to tissues, while waste products diffuse in the opposite direction. This is an important example of the gradient core principle. Now, it's critical to understand that the placenta can also allow components that are harmful to the fetus to go through and affect development, such as viruses, alcohol, recreational drugs. That's why, especially during the first trimester, we caution mothers to stay away from situations where they'd interact, interact with any of these. It's very important to understand that building a new human being is very much like building a house from scratch. If you've ever seen a house built from scratch, it begins with buying a plot of land, digging a hole, pouring a foundation, putting up a frame, putting siding and insulation and interior walls on the frame, putting in the plumbing and the wiring, putting on a roof, the doors and windows, and then painting the house inside and out, hooking up the electricity, the gas and the water, and then you have a home. If you make an error in any of these early steps, such as, say, pouring the foundation, if you have, say, the foundation truck pull up, and instead of the foundation crew on hand, you've got the plumbers there. Okay, and the foundation doesn't get poured properly, the impact of that is going to um, have consequences for the frame, for the siding, and eventually what may happen is the entire house may fall over because you didn't do these initial steps correctly. And that's why um, building a new human being, it's critical for these early steps to go according to Hoyle. If they don't, what's going to happen is that the subsequent steps aren't going to be able to complete properly and a spontaneous abortion may result. Okay, blood flows between the mother and fetus through the placenta. Oxygenated maternal blood flows through the decidua basalis layer of the uterus and then through the maternal arteries into the placental sinus. The maternal blood touches the placental barrier and allows for diffusion of substances but not the interchange of formed elements. Once diffusion has taken place, maternal blood, which is deoxygenated, and carrying waste flows into the maternal veins and back to the mother's cardiovascular system. Deoxygenated fetal blood leaves the fetus and enters two umbilical arteries where it then flows into the placenta and moves into fetal capillaries and chorionic villi on the fetal side of the placental barrier. Fetal blood then picks up oxygen and nutrients and delivers waste by diffusion but again no blood cells move through the barrier. Fetal hemoglobin has a greater affinity for oxygen than maternal, so it pulls oxygen away from the mother's hemoglobin at the barrier. Oxygenated blood leaves the placenta and flows back to the fetus through a single umbilical vein. In addition to its nutritive functions, the placenta also functions as an endocrine organ, assuming production of human chorionic gonadotrophin as it grows 
and results in the subsequent reduction of the syncytia trophoblast. The corpus luteum relinquishes production of progesterone and estrogens by the end of the first trimester. The placenta also produces human placental lactogen and placental prolactin and helps prepare the mammary glands for milk production and relaxin, which relaxes the body's muscles, joints, and ligaments to facilitate stretching during delivery of the newborn. In placenta previa, a part or all of the placenta attaches to the inferior portion of the uterus near or even covering the cervix. Most cases result in live births. It may cause spontaneous abortion or premature birth. Also dangerous to the mother, um, placenta previa stretches the uterus to accommodate fetal and placental growth. The result is that the placenta may hemorrhage and become infected and increase the risk of maternal mortality. Typically, a cesarean section is preferred in the cases of placenta previa. This is where we cut through the mother's abdomen into the uterus and remove the child through an incision instead of through the birth canal. Fetal development is characterized by maturation of tissues and organs. Fetal growth is rapid and fetal size increases dramatically. Common fetal measurements of length include crown rump length or crown heel length. Um, if we look at uh, crown heel length, uh, the embryo usually is about an inch long and can grow to be as large as 20 inches during the fetal period. The weight increases, most obviously in the last eight weeks of development. The average weight of a full-term fetus is between 7 and 8 pounds. Major events in fetal development between three and nine months of pregnancy, the body lengthens as the head growth slows, the upper limbs grow to their birth length, ossification begins in the bones, the eyes are well developed on the lateral sides of the head, the eyelids are fused, the bridge of the nose forms, the external ears are present but not prominent, the genitals are distinguishable as male or female by the end of the third month, the approximate crown rump length is about four inches. By fourth month, the body growth is rapid. We see uh, the limbs lengthen and the joints form as the skeleton continues to ossify. The fetus has nipples and hair. By this point, the kidneys are formed, the GI glands are forming, and the heartbeat can be heard with the stethoscope. It begins to develop reflexes and will startle and turn away from loud noises and bright lights. The approximate CRL is 6 inches by the end of the fourth month. In the fifth month, growth slows and <coughs> the lower limbs. Hair grows on the head and the skin is covered with lanugo and a white to gray secretion composed of shed epithelial cells and sebum known as the vernix caseosa. Both lanugo and caseosa cover and protect the skin from amniotic fluid. <clears throat> Formation of brown fat helps with heat production after the fetus is born. The mother can feel movement, a phenomenon referred to as quickening, as skeletal muscles contract. The length is about 8 inches by the end of the fifth month. <clears throat> In month six, the fetus gains major weight, eyebrows and eyelashes appear, <clears throat> and eyelids, which have been fused since the third month, partially open. The skin is wrinkled and translucent, and the lungs begin to make surfactant, which is key to the survival if the infant is born prematurely. The approximate length is about 9 inches by the end of the sixth month. In month 7, the eyelids open. Fat is deposited in subcutaneous tissue, so the skin is slightly smoother, but still wrinkled and red. The fetus will flip, assuming the vertex position with the head pointing towards the birth canal. In the males, the testes descend, descend through the inguinal canal into the scrotum. By the end of the seventh month, it's 11 inches long on average. <clears throat> In months 8 through 9, the fetal neurons form networks. Blood cells form in the bone marrow. The GI and respiratory system complete development during the ninth month. Fetal skin is less wrinkled and lanugo is shed. In males, 
testes complete their descent into the scrotum. It's about 12 inches long by the end of the eighth month and 14 inches by the end of the ninth. At about 260 day, 66 days post-fertilization, <clears throat> the fetus is considered full term and ready for birth. The scalp usually has hair. Fingers and toes have well-developed nails. If the, however, the fetus is born prior to this time, the tissues and organs may not develop completely. Fetal circulation and cardiovascular system change rapidly after birth to adjust to life outside the womb. Most conspicuous anatomical changes occur between the prenatal and postnatal state in the cardiovascular system. Unique cardiovascular structures present during prenatal development include an umbilical artery and vein and three circulatory shunts called vascular shunts. Blood from the umbilical vein bypasses the liver through the ductus venosus. It's connected to the inferior vena cava and flows into the right atrium of the heart. The foramen ovale is a hole in the inner atrial septum that directly connects the right and left atria. This allows blood to skip ahead and avoid pulmonary circulation by moving directly from the right to the left side of the heart and systemic circulation. The ductus arteriosus is a short passage connecting the pulmonary trunk to the aorta and it allows blood to move from the pulmonary trunk directly into the aorta. After birth, these shunts and the umbilical vesicles close and a normal circulatory pattern starts within a year in most infants. The flaps in the interatrial septum seal and the foramen ovale becomes a depression called the fossa ovalis. Resistance and pressure changes and the pulmonary trunk and aorta cause ducts, the ductus arteriosus to close about three months after birth. The remnant of the ductus arteriosus is known as the ligamentum arteriosum. The venosus also degenerates and becomes the ligamentum venosum. The umbilical arteries become the medial umbilical ligaments, and the umbilical vein becomes the ligamentum teres, or round ligament of the liver. And you can see here the big picture of pre prenatal development. <clears throat> An infant is considered premature if it's born more than three weeks before full term. More than 12% of babies born in the U.S. are premature. The earlier the birth, the more complications the infant is likely to experience. Most commonly, premature infants suffer from respiratory, digestive, and thermoregulatory problems. Most common is IRDS. This develops in infants before 24 weeks because surfactant isn't produced sufficiently in the alveoli of the lungs. Without surfactant, the alveoli collapse during exhalation and are difficult to reinflate due to alveolar surface tension. Synthetic surfactant can help premature infants breathe until their lungs develop. Premature infants often have minimal sucking and swallowing reflexes and require feeding tubes. The underdeveloped liver can't produce enough clotting factor or albumin. As a result, they bleed easily and develop swelling. The hypothalamus is not completely developed and can't maintain a constant body temperature and has to be kept warm in an incubator. Premature birth is the most common cause of infant death in the U.S. Advances in neonatal care have increased survival rates. Almost 30% of infants born at 32 weeks of pregnancy, um, almost 50 to 60% of those born at 24 weeks, and almost 75% of those born at 25 weeks manage to live a long and healthy life. Greater than 90% born at 27 to 20, 28 weeks manage to survive. Note, though, that infants who survive often have lifelong issues such as cerebral palsy, learning disabilities, and hearing and vision loss. Okay, that brings this half of the podcast to an end. Make sure and review this information, as it will be covered on the PRSs and on the exams and quizzes. And I'll see you guys in the last installment of the last podcast of the semester.